Getting into late 70s, early 80s now, Gallipoli is in 1981, for yes. example. Um, my favourite my favorite picture ever that I've made. Gallipoli, what oh, was I that? Loved I loved it. Mate, it was just so Australian to me. Um, the early part was, um, I liked as much as the war part, actually. Um, the mateship between those two guys and the whole, I don't know, just everything was totally believable. The spin of trying to make a quid at the, at the professional running races and betting he's a little Melbourne actor. He's still in films. He must be 100 years old now. It was all, I thought it was great, just great. And um, the, 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 I love the, the, the ending of Gallipoli. That, where the, the, guy, the shot at the oh, end. Oh, mate. I've seen it. A couple of times since, they were ten years apart. I mean, I, it's it's always been my favourite Aussie picture. Always. What was it like to work on it to do the sound for that? Oh, fair. it's great. He's he was great to work with Peter Weir. He had a, he's got a lovely sense of humour, Peter Weir. I'll, I'll tell you a story. This has nothing to do with, with with film. Well, it happened at the mix. We were mixing Gallipoli, and we were at the scene where they were in the trenches. And I love the rugby, but also like a punt. And the editor of the film, Billy Edison, also liked to punt. And there was a horse racing at Canterbury, midweek race meeting at Canterbury, called Trench Digger. And I said to Billy, I reckon this will win this. And look, we're at the bloody trenches of Gallipoli. <laughs> we'll have to bet. So it's we, an omen. <laughs> so we stopped, we stopped the mix. Right, folks, we're going to back this horse today at Canterbury. It's in the Flying Handicap at Canterbury, about 3 o'clock. Um, it's called Trench Digger. Who wants money on it? So... We got, um, you know, a dollar here, to, uh, not, not a dollar, they were, uh, so they were like two dollar, I mean notes then, two yeah. dollar notes and so on. Everybody had something on Trench Digger, including Peter Weir. Billy Anderson went to the tab, we continued mixing, he came back, got the money on, he had this ticket, and he had, you know, I don't know what we had, thirty dollars altogether with about six of us or something. And Patty Lovell, who was the producer, who was the, one of the loveliest ladies that ever, ever lived, she came in and we were mix we had resumed mixing. We'd had lunch. She came in and bought us lunch. Resumed mixing and at about two minutes to three, I stopped the mix and you could stop any time because people realised you were, you know, setting up equal EQs or something, you know. Mm. Stop the mix. I walked back into the into the projection room, which is behind us. I had a transistor radio. They're about to go in this race at Canterbury. And I held the transistor radio on the talk back and pressed the talk back button. And the Blake said, about to, about to start and they're, and they're flying at Canterbury, sounds like a French nigger seven or two, or they not quite the odds, and they jump. And everyone was in the room, every time they said, you mentioned French nigger, they all went, yeah! <laughs> Patty Lovell was just, she didn't know what was happening. <laughs> What's going on? And French nigger won. And they, the crowd went absolutely mad. She said, I'm the producer of this picture, I demand to know what's happened. And we had to explain to her. And Peter Weir thought that was just fantastic. So he had a, he had a great sense of humour. We were also mixing a Peter Weir picture. It may have been, I think it might have been Picnic, when the first big hamburger bar started, bar started in George Street, Hungry Jack's. Oh, yeah. And that was about 500 yards up the road, metres up the road from our studio. So we ordered hamburgers for lunch. And we, we got a dozen hamburgers. This was the brand new thing. And Peter Weir, after we'd re e uh, eaten them, he said, now, well, we've got to have a vote on this. What do you think? Are, are we in favour or are we not in favour of Hungry Jacks? Not as good as the old, the old Greek bloke used to make. Fair enough. He said, I think we should tell them. So he rang Hungry Jacks and complained seriously about the hamburgers. Look, uh, We've, we've, we've been looking forward to your, um, and he's very quiet, so we've been looking forward to uh, your establishment opening, we've been seeing the advertisements and so on, so we've come up, we've bought a dozen hamburgers, and quite frankly, we have been a little bit disappointed. Um, well, some thought there wasn't enough of this, some thought not enough of that, and this very serious phone call, and we're wetting ourselves laughing. Anyway, this, they said, we'll send a chap down to see you. <laughs> so they were gonna send this bloke down to see Peter Weir and discuss, why the hamburgers weren't so good, you know? And he never, never arrived. And we were in the middle of mixing next day. And I said, Pete, that guy didn't come from Hungry Jack's. You're right, he said. End of this reel, we'll ring back. <laughs> we finished the reel, he <laughs> rang back. And the guy said, oh, I thank you, Mr. Weir. I think a dozen hamburgers arrived with the kid. 
<laughs> Did he know who he was talking to? <laughs> he would have who Peter well, Weir. But he wouldn't know who Peter Weir was. No. But, but, I, but those things happen when, when you're in a very happy environment. Mm. I mean, that's not important that we got 12 hamburgers. The, was no, it speaks to the fact that people like Beresford and Weir, they know. But down to earth people, they're real people, you know? Part of a director's job is to set the tone. Yeah. For the work experience. Agreed. For everyone around them. Agreed. For the crew. Yeah. Uh, during production and even in post, which sure. is, you know, can be a long, well, you're doing it in two weeks flat, sure. but it can be a long process. Sure. We taught Paddy Lovell what a rolling mall was. <clears throat> now, for you, the people watching who don't know rugby, a rolling mall is when you get about six or eight big buffeted guys together, and one of them's got the ball, and you drive towards the line, and like it's a, it's a phalanx in, 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 in uh, you know, war terms and you drive to and you and it's virtually impossible and now you go over the line you fall down and you've scored patty lovell came in and she said peter i've been reading about the rugby i want to know what a rolling mall is i said well it's very difficult to explain trish but i said we'll show you i want you to take this film can hold it to your bosom don't let it go and imagine that's the ball and four of us picked her up and we carried her towards us <laughs> And she was hysterical. She was like, I don't want to know anymore. Know. <laughs> but again, she was, she was a, a producer of, of really good... Did, did, uh, did you, you know, often get mood. producers coming into, into the mix and oh, yeah. voicing oh, yeah. their opinion? Oh, absolutely. Was My that word. a problem for the director sometimes? Yes, it was. Yes, it was <laughs> sometimes. Um, I did one picture, and I'm not going to mention or name it, but the producer and the director had fallen out so far that the director had... Um, uh, bar the producer from coming to the mix and the producer came and claimed that he was entitled to come and that was pretty pretty heavy because that's in the middle of which one to mix the picture that was heavy and then another time <coughs> the producer or producers barred the director from coming to the mix <laughs> and he was the one of my favourite directors, that was pretty heavy too. Now, again, no names, but have you had experience with directors that weren't part of this and maybe should have been and it causes problems? Weren't part of the sound mix as where they're you know, sitting in, watching you, make, putting in their two cents? In those days, no, because the directors were there all the time. I don't forget, it only took two weeks. Now it's taking an enormous time to mix a picture for reasons that, for a lot of good reasons. But in those times, no, the director, he did nothing else till he finished that picture. He certainly so wasn't finish the, the picture cut, <clears throat> go straight to sound. Sure. Yeah. He certainly wasn't doing something else, you know. Um, so no, it didn't happen. But I did mix a picture once where we'd been hammered and hammered to do it really cheaply. So we had to hammer um, uh, the studio. We were now mixing and we were hiring um, um, Film Australia's mixing uh, complex up at Linfield. And we hired that. Um, and we had to, to hammer them for the time and the money. And the producer didn't come at all till the end of the second day and said, I don't like the, I don't like the real one, I don't like real two. And I said, well, mate, you, you've got to be here. I can't be here. He said, but I'm the producer. I said, well, we've got to, we've got to mix this for nothing, essentially. We're going to do it in this short time. So if you can't do it, we can't do it. And that was, that was pretty heavy. That got, that got quite... Mm -hmm got a bit angry you know but um, I, I've always been um, it's hard when you analyze yourself isn't it but I haven't got a very long fuse if people are being unreasonable and I just said mate if you can't be here, we can't do it too bad so uh, but most of the time it's been fairly oh yeah it's been a that, that happens rarely those sort of confrontations very I very rarely in my experience yes whether it happens now or not, I don't know. The chance there it might because producers now are, you know, they're, they're, they're bigger than Don Bradman was in my day, you know. Mm. <laughs>